Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Chad Himes here, and I'm bringing my friend Bob Stewart along today. Bob, how are you? Um, like bringing me along, I mean, like kicking and screaming. I, I feel like sometimes it feels that way, Bob. <laughs> sometimes it's uh, just to put my arm around you. and We're going for a stroll. Well, look, when we bring smart people here to like share good, valuable stuff with our audience, you're never dragging me along kicking and screaming. So I'm excited to be here. Well, yes, because we are bringing smart people to share things with our audience because it's you, me and someone new. We left Ben out of this one again, right? right? Just to take a well, shot and, at him not being here. And we, we know you're not very smart. I'm not very no. smart. So if no. we want to class this place up a little bit, we got to find help. Yes, we do. So we have brought with us a guest today and we're going to bring on to the Win Make Give podcast, Jonathan Goldhill. Jonathan, thank you for joining us here today. Hey, I'm here to help you guys out. You know, Well, we've just raised the, the level of intelligence and smartness by bringing you into this. Is smartness a word? Because if it's not, I just made it up. Okay. It's clearly not a word, which is like to the point of why we're here. <laughs> exactly. Okay, exactly. All right. Margaret. So, Jonathan, uh, I've been told it's apparently the lazy way. I'll finally stop uh, knocking at Jimmy Mackin on that one for that. Because when it comes to introducing our guests to the audience, We've done our research, but I don't like to just read some bio that you had or anything like that. I want you to put in your words what matters, what's important to you. Introduce yourself to the Win Make Give audience so they get to feel who you are. So, Chad, uh, Bob, I would introduce myself as someone who is passionate about artists and entrepreneurs. And this has long been a passion of mine. I started a business back in 1986 that involved uh, art and clothing and tried to scale that, learned that I didn't choose my partner very well. And as a result, I closed the business down and then decided to go to business school and get an MBA and work with entrepreneurs as a consultant. And uh, so my story is that I come from a family that had a multi-generational business. It was a very large clothing business. And my grandfather, who I always looked up to as a self-made man, was an artist. And he spent an hour or two painting before he went to work, got up at four o'clock in the morning, painted. So he really lived his passion. And, you know, he developed an incredible freedom in his life. And that freedom was passed on uh, to his, uh, his progeny, the right word, guys you know, his yeah. next gen, right? Yeah. And uh, it gave me a certain amount of freedom. It allowed me to move to California and and then, you know, kind of pursue things that interested me. And I circled back around to working with entrepreneurs about 30 years ago and being a consultant to them. And, and then I circled even tighter into family businesses because I realized there are a lot of family businesses that could use help. They can use help with succession planning. They can use help with scaling up methodologies. And I just started, you know, living that passion and that dream of always wanting to help, like sort of a noblesse oblige, if you know, like that, like since I felt like I had been afforded a certain freedom, I wanted to help others find their freedom. And I had also had some good success early on in some entrepreneurial businesses and some failures that taught me a lot more. So that, that clothing business, that art and clothing business, it was a failed partnership. I learned a ton and, uh, you know, here I am 30 plus years later, loving the work that I do with small businesses, family businesses, entrepreneurs, and, and next generation leaders. So, all right. Cool. So Bob's about to like ask like 7,000 questions from things you said in there. We all know what our audience is all sitting there going, wait, Chad, Bob has a bunch of questions. No, 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 no. Hang on. We just, I want to just get this in first. We just did an episode not too long ago, episode 51 for anyone who hasn't listened to it or wants to scroll back on the hard truths of things they don't teach you in business school. So you went into business, failed business, then went to business school. And now you tell us one thing that you know in business, that you would teach somebody for business that they don't teach you in business school? Oh, wow. Gosh. So uh, one of the first things that a lot of coaches have latched onto is that there's five ways to grow a business. And they, they don't teach you this in business school because it's, it's way too simple. They wouldn't, it's not, you know, to have five ways to grow a business. And so um, the obvious and first way is that you count the number of leads that you generate and you increase 
those number of leads. Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. I mean, pretty basic stuff, right? But too basic for business school. The second thing is if you improve your conversion rate on the number of leads that you generate, then you can grow your business that way also. All right. Sounds pretty obvious and basic. Yep. The third way is um, if you sell to them on a, like a larger package, you know, we call that upselling, right? You sell yeah. them so, or you sell them something as a follow on sale um, then or you sell them something on a recurring basis as a follow up sale. Right. Your guy, you go out and you do the roof inspection and then you explain to them that, hey, you could have uh, an annual contract and we could put you on a monthly plan. So so now we've got a recurring model as well. And then, of course, if you reduce your gross margin, you improve your gross margin, sorry, by reducing your cost of goods sold, you know, either your materials or your labor or, you know, that that you can grow a business that way. And then the fifth way is that you can cut your costs. Um, and this is too basic for them to teach in business school. Right. So, uh, I mean, they, they, they got to, Jonathan, at business school, you, they, you got to stroke them that big check at the end of the day. So they got to make it really complicated so that when you stroke that check, you're like, OK, I couldn't have learned this anywhere else. You know, the other thing about business school, though, is they're basically training managers to go into Fortune 1000 companies. So they're teaching the next gen, the, ne the leaders of corporations and that's not what I went to business school. I went to an entrepreneurial business school. They teach different things in the entrepreneurial business school, but that one was too basic. We, uh, we have this, this saying around here that um, people complicate things to justify their inaction. Like this to me kind of screams that, right? Like this is boiled down to the simplest form. And if I wanted to take action and grow a business today, I'd just figure out which one of these things I need to start go doing. Yeah. You know, I, I want to share one other thing guys, that they don't teach you in business school, which is that most business owners are entrepreneurs by default, not by design. And so, and what mostly what they teach you in business school is how to be a better, again, corporate manager. So they don't teach you that 99% or 95% of all businesses are under a million dollars. People are just trying to, you know, they're struggling to survive. And then, uh, you know, that's a very different mindset than what they're teaching at, you know, business school. These, I mean, like in your work with, with all these small businesses, entrepreneurs, family owned businesses, most of those people probably didn't get MBAs, I would imagine, right? No, no like yeah. nobody did. I mean, when I'm working with a, a, a fast growth, like a gazelle type company, I call it a gazelle because it's going to go from seven figures to eight figures really fast. Um, those guys are pretty sophisticated and they've got MBAs, college degrees, and they're, they're building the, the unicorns of the world. But, you know, how many people really work for those co uh, companies, right? And yeah. how, many, how many entrepreneurs really are those types of entrepreneurs? Like maybe in our lifetime, maybe we've met a few of them, but yeah. not likely. Yeah, we got one of them with us. He's just not on the episode today because Ben's off entrepreneuring something. Yeah. I've just had a verb, right? <laughs> but that's, he's probably uh, one of two, like he said, that I've met in my life. Yep. Like there's Correct. not a lot of those, those folks around. Yeah. Okay. So Jonathan, you, um, you have an entrepreneurial training program to uh, help companies, you know, lots of different industries you're in. So, I mean, you see it over uh, lots of different industries. Give us a lesson or two for all the entrepreneurs that are listening on this podcast, because so much of our audience are entrepreneurs uh, or their kids stuck in the car listening. Give us a, a lesson you would just share generally with an entrepreneur overall moving in the right direction. Yeah. So, you know, um, I put together this book and I put together this framework and it's a roadmap for scaling up any business. And and one of it's I call it my seven P's framework. Um, and and Chad, what I really like about that framework is first of all, you can start anywhere in that framework, but the thing I like is, is purpose. It's a big topic of discussion today. You know, Simon Sinek did that Ted talk that got really popular. It was probably start with why. Yeah. And, okay. and I think it's a really timely or, you know, it's evergreen in terms of its timeliness that people should really know what their purpose is. 
what their calling is. Why are they doing it? Right. Because it's never just about money. It's, you know, or it may, it may be, but is that going to be sustainable? I think people really need to dig into why are they doing what they're doing and how can they get other people excited about their why? And their why has to be more than just making money because nobody cares how much money you make or how much money I make. They want to know what's in it for them. And so I think that looking at the purpose and trying to expand it and trying to be inclusive of other people in that purpose, the people that are working for you, let's call them your stakeholders because they may just be more than your employees. They may be your customers. They may be your investors. They may be your vendors, you know, suppliers. So having a, some clear why, I mean, have, have you ever been in a room? The reason why I started off and said I, I love being around artists and entrepreneurs, like artists are like the opposite of entrepreneurs. Right? <laughs> they, they don't think about like, how am I going to monetize this and make money from this necessarily? They just, they follow their passion and their why is that they're, they're there to make a difference and they want to, you know, they're the, they're interesting people to hang out with, I think at a party that, you know. I'm not gravitating towards the engineers or the accountants <laughs> or the insurance salesmen. Probably none of us are, right? Or the real estate broker. No offense to a lot of you guys listening. I mean, we're and even consultants. Look, we're not that interesting. You know, you want to get around interesting people. Talk to artists. Talk to entrepreneurs. Or or talk to people who are, you know, masters of their craft wherever they are. And uh, and so I think purpose is just so critical. And, Can I ask you, yeah. because you've worked with a lot of small businesses, and, and I'm assuming that this framework is part of the framework you use when, you, when you're consulting with them, do you see any common threads of like, like a theme of a purpose that a lot of people, like, you know, is it, is it helping the community? Is it providing a legacy for my kids? Is it like, are there common themes where, that people find purpose around? I think yes, but I think... Uh, you, you might be onto this more than I. I. I've not looked to see the common themes, but I think those are two of them. I think it's like there's some element of uh, like uh, good or, you know, making things better or making life better. Um, I think there's some legacy piece, like you just said. Let, help me out here. What do you guys think? Like, could be some other. Well, I think it's research for you for your next book now, Jonathan. Right? I think I think we just gave you the yeah, idea I for mean, the next would, book. Those would be those would af- absolutely be two, right? Um, yeah. You know, I mean, some people like my my mom is a is a real estate agent and and was retired and came back into the force to. Uh, I guess her her purpose would be education like she wants to put my my kids and my brother's kids through college that's like her thing right and right and so you know i I don't know is that money is that legacy it's you know it's she has a very defined why that she gets up and comes into real estate when she didn't need to do that she could have probably stayed retired right but um but she had some vision for wanting to expand things maybe she wanted to create opportunities for that generation. Yeah, because, she you wanted know, to. She, she felt badly for Bob, so she wanted to take care of his kids. Chad, it's actually not me; it's my brothers. So let's not get this <laughs> twisted. She wants to make sure my brother's children go to go to college, right? Which all right, Bob, they're listening. So next family meeting, have Golden, fun with that one. Maya, uh, Ava, Ronan, you guys get your asses to college. Grandma's right. paying for it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's probably lots of, of common. I think the biggest challenge, though, sometimes you talk about this why. You talk about Simon Sinek's uh, Start With Why TED Talk, which is very, very, very popular and a wonderful book that he wrote as well. I think it's also one of the most paralyzing things, just to stick with the P terms here. Yep. I think it's one of the more paralyzing things when you ask somebody, so what's your why? Yes. Because it's so overwhelming and so encompassing. How do you deal with that when... Maybe you're talking to someone who hasn't really identified it yet, Jonathan. Have you found that situation? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. Um, Chad, it is one of the most paralyzing things. And it's the question that I fear most that people might ask of me. Because I'm always wondering, like, wait, is, is that it? Like, because it's never a memorized, for me, nothing's ever a memorized, like, uh, pitch. And so you're always testing its authenticity. And so... To answer your question, for me, I have a lot of empathy towards my clients and I'm patient with them as they're trying to figure it out because it isn't always obvious. It isn't always right on the, you know, like the tip of their tongue. But there's a moment, I call it an aha moment or an epiphany when Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it clicks 
And people started going, I get it. I like it. I'm on board. And that's when you know you have it. You feel it. Um, I've seen it with a client of mine who once we, and, and they, theirs was similar to yours, Chad, um, or Bob, I'm sorry, Bob, their, theirs was similar to like your mom's. They thought that their purpose was to help new immigrants become like naturalized citizens and develop careers in, uh, in the construction industry. But then they said, you know, that like, that wasn't it. It just didn't, it didn't speak to all the stakeholders, didn't speak to all of their employees. And so they sort of made it more open. They changed it to raising the bar and raising the bar. If you think about it, I mean, it, you know, you can include those new immigrants in that because for them, raising the bar is, is getting to become naturalized citizen. But it was also about like doing good works in the community. It was also about being recognized in their industry. It was also about giving back um, and being a leader in, in their business, in their industry. So everything for them is measured by like, are you raising the bar? Are you, do you want to be in this company to raise the bar? If not, then you don't fit. So, so I think purposes are like short in terms of number of words, maybe eight words or less They're They have an aha effect. They raise the level of everyone's uh, connection or passion or uh, engagement with what the business is all about. It's way beyond making profit. And it has some f- central themes, Bob, like, like legacy, like doing good, like making a difference, something like that. Love it. Love it. And, and, and your, I think your, your last story there, Jonathan, makes a great point to our audience members. It can change, yeah. right? You might be going down this one path and then all of a sudden say, no, that's not working for me. It's not making me get up in the morning. I'm going to, what if I changed it to, oh yeah, now I'm excited. Now I feel the passion that comes from having that purpose. I do. Let me just, but let me, um, I'm not going to disagree with you. I just want to like put a little counterpoint, which is that I think. Okay. Bob disagrees with me all the time. Well, I think that once you get your purpose, it's like a mission, a calling, it doesn't change. And you take that, that's something that's like, like permanent in your life. And that you take into the next business, you probably have a very similar purpose. Um, what I want to say, though, is that it might get like broadened out. So like the raising the bar is pretty broad. A lot of things can go into raising the bar. I mean, they actually have cups with guys like lifting, uh, like, oh, you know, weightlifting. Um, so, you know, you, you can uh, you can take the words and make it more generic. So, but I think that purpose is like mission or calling and that once we find ours, it, it modifies only slightly over a long period of time. That's what I want to say. Excellent. All right. So you're talking about your book, Disruptive Successor. Yes. Right. Just let's give it the plug, right? Anybody out there who's going, I want more of this. Okay. You're going to go check out Jonathan Goldhill and Disruptive Successor. We'll have the link to the book in the show notes as well for everybody. And you're talking about your seven P's, kind of the the seven P's, the framework that makes up your playbook here. And the first one was purpose. Correct. The second one you have, because I I did my research. I'm not the lazy man's interviewer here, Bob. Okay. So I did. The second one is planning. Yes. So talk to us a little bit about planning as you're talking to all the entrepreneurs listening to this episode. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, in business school, they teach you the term strategic planning. That's a big, you know. And so in my world, we, we parse that word into strategic thinking and execution planning. And so strategic thinking is about like thinking three, five years out. It's thinking where are you are trying to take this business? Um, it's thinking about purpose. It's thinking about culture. Execution planning is literally three months, one year, you know, um, and, and week to week. And so I think that entrepreneurs – too many of them jump into the business. They they furiously find out you know what the product and the market and what the fit is and and where their space is and who their ideal and core customer is and um, but they don't spend enough time planning the business and it, it's more than just financial planning. It's marketing planning. It's operations planning. It's business model planning. 
And it's always looking for creating some kind of set of procedures, which I have a later P to talk about processes, so that you can build a scalable business. So essentially, planning is about business planning. I came across the, the, the wording I came across when I was plan for your 10x, which would yes. be that scale, right? Like, Correct. We, we run something today. We want to run something that looks like that. How do we get from here to there? What's that scale look like? Exactly. Okay. okay. Let's big. keep going through it. So yep, yep. next on the list is products. Talk yep. to us about the P that is products. Yeah. So I think that people take their products for granted too often. And you need to look at what are the products or services that you're selling? How can you improve the experience um, or the quality or the, how they're delivered, how they're received? And so I spend a fair amount of time in my book talking about marketing and marketing your products and understanding customers' needs and identifying those and matching them up with, uh, make sure there's a really strong fit. And that also means that you need to be getting out and talking to your customers to understand how they're experiencing your product or service. So, we, you know, products like surveys or marketing surveys that get feedback on how they experience it. So that's sometimes it's, sometimes it's calling and talking to them. Like I think about our industry, real estate, right? Like you're just as likely to, to learn what they thought of by like literally asking them, calling and talking to them. Right. You know, people, they leave reviews or maybe they'll fill out the, but a lot of times as an entrepreneur, you just got to get in there and like, go meet your customer to yeah. get that feedback. Yeah. You know, and you got to ask questions like, you know, how are we doing? You know, what else, how are other people doing? Have you talked to other people in this industry? You know, what was, uh, what did they offer? Or what was your experience of working with them? Or, um, you know, you need to get that feedback. You have to get belly to belly with them. Okay, so that that logically leads to the next one. So we've gone through purpose, right? Planning products. Right. Now, uh, purpose I knew was a conversation, right? We would definitely talk about purpose, planning products. I think just the titles alone pretty clear to it. But this next one I think has got to be a really big one here, Jonathan, and that's it's people. Yes. So talk to us about people and how that fits in the disruptive successors framework and playbook for people out there. Yeah, so you have to, first of all, make sure that you have the right people on your in your company, right? Jim Collins talks about the right people on the bus yep. and, uh, and then put them in the right seats. Um, so you have to have a really robust, not only evaluation or a system to analyze and evaluate your people, but you also have to have a great program for hiring and retaining your people. And so I'm a big fan of of systems like top grading or the who methodology for hiring. I think that people don't hire very effectively, especially small businesses. They make a lot of hiring mistakes. They don't use psychometric assessments, which improve your, you know, making sure you've got the right fit. Um, they don't do a lot of techniques, which I share in my book, like the three by three by three interview like the tandem interview, like creating a job scorecard and evaluating someone against that scorecard. So there are a lot of mistakes that people make in the hiring process itself. And so look, look, frankly, in a market like today, where you're an entrepreneur trying to build your business, I mean, one of the ways you have to market your company is by marketing yourself as an employer, because people have a lot of choices. Uh, including some people say, you know, hey, people are getting paid a lot of money just to stay at home. Why should they go to work? So if you don't market your company as a place to work, like you're missing out on where probably a lot of your marketing dollars need to be spent today. And that's about, you know, attracting the best people for your company. That's largely what I'm talking about in, in those chapters. We you just know, did a whole series uh, on uh, talent, what we called the talent series, where we went from where to find talent, how to hire talent, and all of that kind of stuff through our episodes. You mentioned so many different systems in there, right? Uh, scorecard. Pick one of them. Just pick one of those things. We don't want everyone to get the whole book. Go, go, go read the book, folks, if you want to hear about all. But pick one of them and dive into it a little bit more to help me hire talent. Sure. So Top Grading and The Who were both created by a father-son team. It was called Top Grading. It was 
uh, developed at General Electric when Jack Welch was the CEO. And they had a lot of techniques that they recommended uh, for an interviewing process. So one of them was to create a job scorecard. And in the job scorecard, which I think probably is arguably one of the most valuable pieces of their whole methodology, which is like, what's the mission or the purpose of this particular position? What are three to five measurable outcomes that this person will be responsible for? Um, And then what are qualities and attributes or characteristics or competencies that this person should have? Um, And that could include like academic qualifications or technical qualifications or or language, whether it's, you know, second language like Spanish or um, or writing. Um, And so and then finally, uh, having some if you have values established for your business, then having a series of questions that try and ascertain how well this person fits with the core values of your company. Um, because you want good culture fit. And so when you have a really well done job scorecard, now you can go out and interview candidates and grade them according to those competencies, according to how well you think they could accomplish those results based on their prior experience and how well they fit the core values. And by using a tool like the scorecard, you can keep yourself really honest because look, we all know that typically the first person and the last person that you interview are the people that you remember the best, right? That oftentimes one person um, is a really good interviewer because they're charismatic and they, there's what I call a halo effect. And you think like, Oh, that person, like the third person we interviewed, they were the best. I don't think anyone's going to match up to them. And then you lose sight during the fourth, fifth and sixth candidate interviews of all the pool, you know, and you forget about the first and second one. So having a scorecard, measuring people against that scorecard, and then at the end of the whole setting or, you know, after this or sit of all these interviews is then you can compare notes. So that's one part of that technique. The other thing I really like in their system is the tandem interview where two people or, or a team are usually involved in the interview. One person's doing the interviewing, the other person's taking notes um, and based on their observations. So one person isn't trying to do both things. And then my system of the three by three by three, which is, I don't know if I got that from top grading, but it's like three different interviews in three different situations um, with three different people, you know, or th- situations could be three different places. So if you're hiring someone who's going to be doing a lot of customer facing activity and uh, or customer support or service or sales, like I might want to meet them at a restaurant or at a Starbucks to see how do they relate to the server? You know, are they kind? Are they considerate? Are they respectful? So, you know, so that's a little bit of a deep dive into the uh, top grading system, which I think I, uh, is among the best. I feel Jonathan, like, uh, Chad, we get these guests and like the stuff that, that they say, John, all the stuff you've been like, we did a, 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 an episode on Jack Welch in our, in our first season, by yeah. the way, ruthless at grading their people. Like I, I, Chad, I don't remember the numbers, but they fire like the bottom eight or five or 10% of the 10, like every year, 10%, 10%. They just get them 10%. Out. like you're, yeah. you're not, well, you're not like, oh man. So it doesn't surprise me that, that you would, that that is a, a methodology. Look, Jack Welch, I mean, yeah, you knew like what a he legend, was doing, right? A, an you know, icon. People and, that worked for him, Chad, like they said, uh, and Bob, they said that he, they called him Neutron Jack because he blew things up, and you know, right. like he left a lot of people in its in their wake, but because he was very Darwinian in his approach. But honestly, uh, you know, he produced more Fortune 500 CEOs than probably any other company in the United States. And he presided over the greatest rise in shareholder value, I think, in a company over a decade. So he's an amazing story. And like Bob said, we have a whole episode just on him back in season one. Scroll back, people. All right. So I want to be respectful of your time. I want to be respectful of our audience's time. But if you're counting, folks, we've only gotten through four of the seven P's. Right. I don't want to leave anybody in suspense. This next one, again, it's a term that we use a lot when we're talking around our world, and that's priorities. 
So again, priorities is almost a contradiction in term right there because you're supposed to have one and priorities makes it plural. But talk to us a little bit about priorities as the P, Jonathan, in your in your playbook. Yeah, so I, I would agree. I think that too, too often entrepreneurs have too many priorities and they are giving their uh, managers, their leaders, their staff, whatever, they're giving them too many priorities. And there's so many different marching messages that they don't know what direction to move in. And so one, I think that teams... And individuals should have one overarching priority, which is really important. Two, I think that they ought to have maybe descent, like two or three descending priorities. And these are things that are going to move the business forward in a really big way over the next period of time. And that would be like three months period. What are, what are the rocks, as we call them, that need to be moved forward and like, let's break some milestones down for those priorities to see that they're on track. And then let's help them if they're getting stuck. But, you know, move, if you want to have breakthroughs in your business, they t- it's done by basically taking lots of mini steps to move the business forward. And if you don't have priorities and if you don't have measurables, like I talked about KPIs or metrics earlier, then how do you know? whether things are getting better or just staying the same. So that's what the priorities is all about. Okay. So let's move on to you. You already gave this one away as the next one. And that was processes. Yes. So So talk to us about processes before we hit the seventh P. Yes. If you want to build a scalable business, then you need to have documented procedures processes and systems, right? Systems to me are like you have HR systems, you have accounting systems, you have marketing systems, you have sales systems, and then processes are sub systems. They're, they're, they fall underneath those large categories of systems. And that way, you know that if you're doing hiring and someone else in your organization is doing hiring and a third person is doing hiring, that they're not inconsistent across the entire company. So if you're going to be able to get out of doing certain activities in your business, you're going to elevate yourself um, and delegate things. You have to know that there, that people are following like a standard process, right? So in a restaurant, if I'm the head chef um, and I'm out for a week or a month or I leave, we don't want the way the dishes are made to be coming out any different, right? We want the, the cooked meals to be the same. So very important that processes are established that are consistent. Jonathan, I would imagine, like, especially working in a lot of like family businesses, I would imagine you go into a lot of businesses where everybody kind of knows the process, but it's never been documented. Right. I mean, that's a big thing in in our world. You know, we come from the residential real estate sales world and like we've built really big residential sales businesses By documenting the processes, we have this concept that like in our world, if you want to move on to the next opportunity, that you have to have left like the training and the processes for that next person that's going to fill your role, right? So, I mean, is that pretty common that you come into a lot of businesses where they they have processes that are just not documented? No, I I find that most clients that I work with don't have, and most clients I work with, so let me give some framework here. Most of them that start working with me are between... 10 and 100 employees, maybe 10 and 80 employees, and they don't have good documented processes. Okay. They're not stored in a central depository or repository where they're referring to them. And people are definitely not trained on them. So, or, and, and everyone's developed different, you know, ways of, of doing the processes. So, um, so in my, in, in my experience, too often they don't exist and okay. or they're just they're explained but they're not written there's not a video they're not being taught they become this tribal knowledge that gets passed along it's like a game of telephone right like they start here and then by the time they get to the guy we just hired now he's got a totally different story than the, the yep. business owner maybe that created that process in their head yep. 10 years ago exactly yeah. okay so bob i'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to recite the first six 
even though I know you're over there taking notes and you could do yeah, it. Purpose, plan, products, people, priorities, processes. I got this, man. All right. There you go. You got it. All right. Let's get to number seven. Jonathan, number seven, of course, is we have to finish it up and have performance. Right. So talk to us a little bit about the seventh, why that one is number seventh, because I got a feeling it wasn't by accident that it ended up being the last one of them. And talk to us a little bit about performance. Yeah. So I, I don't know why I made it the last. I think, uh, you know, when I used to write business plans, when I first got started, I usually start with the financial sections because I wanted to see what the outcome, because maybe I was trying to think like, how feasible is this business? Is it going to make money? But, you know, so performance, I'm obviously talking about profit and loss statements as, you know, because you can't skip that. But too many small businesses and entrepreneurs don't understand that there's two other financial statements that are really important. And one is the balance sheet. So understanding what is the balance sheet and explaining that and what are some of the key ratios that you need to be looking at both in the profit and loss and the balance sheet. But probably the most underlooked or overlooked area is to measure performance in terms of your return on investment or return on invested capital. Now, that's pretty common in real estate. If you're an investor, you're looking at your ROI or, or your IRR, but it's not for business owners. And yet, you know, if you bought like a basket of stocks or you bought, let's say, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, you know, Alphabet, Google, whatever. Well, then good for you. <laughs> well, yes. But you would probably say like, look, I, I put 100000 in and now I have 150000 I made a 50% you know, return on my investment. And so how often do you look at your business and say, well, what was the return on investment of my business? And so it's more than just the net profit. It's also like the return on assets. If you have assets in your business, whether that, those could be trucks, that could be equipment, it could be intellectual property, like what were the sales that you made on those assets? And so uh, that gets into understanding a little bit about your financial leverage and the setup of your business. But you really need to evaluate what your return on invested capital is in your business because you do have that option. You could not start a business take that same money and put it into FANG, you know, and, and get a pretty decent return. But hopefully yeah. you'll do a lot better, a lot better than 50%, maybe more like 80%. And uh, that's not easily accomplished just through the net profit. You have to look at what are, what are the assets that I'm leveraging? And, and so I explain a lot of that in the book. And uh, I think that's just overlooked and all too important. I mean, th this is, I would imagine when people come to you, and I don't know, but that, you know, they're, they're running a business. They're just, they just work in the business, Jonathan, right? Yeah. It's like every day they're trying to, to make another sale or, or, or deliver on the promise they, they promised yeah. yesterday. Or that these things do force you to kind of step back. It's almost one of those like, you know, two steps back, three steps forward type of thing. You kind of got to slow down and come up here at a, at a higher level and, and start to put these processes in place figure out how we're even measuring performance. I, I would imagine a lot of these you know, business owners that are just grinding away. It, it, that's why they come to you, right? They're well, like, look, I've been grinding yeah. away. And yeah. And, you know, um, I used to do an exercise when people would come to me, Bob, I would uh, throw uh, numbers on a page that were a one to a hundred and they were scattered in different places. And I'd ask them to circle number one, then circle number two, then circle number three, then circle number four. And I'd give them 30 seconds. And usually they'd get up to like seven. Or if they were lucky, they'd get up to like 13. And then I would give them the same sheet of paper. And i say, okay, now we're going to do it again. But I've now framed the, every, I put, I, I framed the numbers in boxes. There's four boxes. And what happens is now, I mean, obviously they've already done this. But they start to see that there's a pattern, the way things work, and they double their score in 30 seconds, right? So they went from 7 to 14 or 13 to 26, and they're going, wow. And I say, look, guys, this is what the numbers on the page, the first sheet, that's what your business looks like the way, through your lens right now. You don't really see the system. You don't really see the structure. You don't see that there's like a framework, like the seven Ps, and you're not looking at through, through that lens. And once you look at things through a lens like that, you can start to organize your business 
and you can understand it a lot better and you'll do a lot better at it because you'll understand, okay, okay, this is in the people bucket. This is the bucket maybe that we need to spend the most time on, or this is the purpose bucket. We don't have time for that. We haven't figured that out. Let's put that on hold. Or, you know, we need to focus on the performance bucket. So I think that people come to me because they are oftentimes overwhelmed. They're not seeing the, 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 the pattern through the numbers, you know, they're not seeing the, like the, the forest through the trees or whatever the expression is. And so my job is to help put some clarity around it is to simplify it is to help them see there's predictability and repeatability and to coach them up as leaders so that they're doing a better job with their people to elevate them and help them understand that there's a system to growing this business. That's I hope awesome. That, hope that made sense. It, it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. And we, we love systems here at Win Make Give, right? We're all about systems and having all that stuff in place. So, Jonathan, I got a few questions for you about the book and people. But before we do that, we want to live up to the Win Make Give name. Uh, and on your behalf, we're going to make a donation to a charity for you joining us here today, what charity is it that this episode we're going to make a donation to? Let's uh, make a charity charitable donation to Habitat for Humanity. What a great organization. Uh, yeah, they're doing some really good work for people who need housing and don't have it. Perfect. We will absolutely be making a donation to those groups. We hope that you audience members are making sure you're sharing these episodes because every listen ups how much money we're giving. So make sure you're sharing this episode with others who need to listen to it and make sure you're joining us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash win make give, because in there we ask every now and then to our audience to give us some charities to fill in for the episodes that don't necessarily have a guest. So that's where we ask each and every one of you. Okay, Jonathan, so they've gotten the the seven Ps. They got an overview. They want to read Disruptive Successor. They can go get it. We have the book link right in our show notes for you, or I'm sure they could go Google you, Google it. I'm sure it's on Amazon, somewhere along those lines. But how can they find you if they want to connect with you after this episode and, and maybe ask more or learn more about you? Yeah, I think the best way is to go to LinkedIn. Um, Jonathan Goldhill, the Goldhill Group, Disruptive successor, each one of those, myself, my company, my book, all have LinkedIn pages. So I think that's the best way. Of course, you can go to my website, thegoldhillgroup.com, and my website, disruptivesuccessor.com. All right. Well, we appreciate you taking that time and sharing with us. On behalf of Bob, on behalf of myself, we want to thank our audience members for this amazing episode. Again, make sure you're joining us in our Facebook group. Make sure you're sharing it. And remember, until that next episode, as always, do good.